In the fall of 1985, I left home and traveled to an unfamiliar country. I landed in this place. The experience of this place radically changed my life trajectory. This place horrified me. Yet at some level, it fascinated me. In many ways, I'm still coming to terms with what I saw in this place. Where is it? Beirut? Belfast? Bosnia? Before I tell you, let me tell you about where I grew up. Montreal, Canada is a beautiful, cosmopolitan and diverse city. It hosted the 1967 World's Fair, the 1976 Olympic Games. Remember Nadia Comaneci and the perfect 10 in gymnastics? I was there. It's a city that's rich in parks and open space, outdoor cafes, public art, street theater, high quality housing, and a state of the art public transportation system. My brothers and I grew up in Montreal in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and we felt nurtured by that city. See, Canada has a strong social compact with its citizens. We all know Canada has universal health care, but it's also got a universal child care benefit, paid vacation, guaranteed sick leave, high quality community resources, parks, recreation centers, and community infrastructure, and highly subsidized post-secondary education. I went to McGill University basically for free. Canada invests in its citizens. When I graduated college, I was told that Johns Hopkins was the best medical school in the world. And in fact, there's a saying in Hopkins, which is, we may not be the best, but there's nobody better. When I landed at Hopkins, I was delighted. I was elated to have been accepted there, and I walked through the doors out into the community, and this is what I saw. I landed in East Baltimore, and I had never seen anything like it. I was being toured around by an upperclassman, and he saw the look of shock on my face, and he said, what's wrong with you? And I managed to stammer, when was there a war here? And I'll never forget what he said to me. He looked at me with this look of utter disdain. And he said, what'd you expect? It's the inner city. What did I expect? I was supposed to expect this? These atrocious and dehumanizing conditions were a norm in an American city. And I was left to wonder, is the U.S. really a first world country? I saw children in the clinics at Johns Hopkins, and I couldn't help but wonder, what would have happened to me if I'd grown up in East Baltimore? Would I have been able to attend Johns Hopkins Medical School and become a doctor? What is owed to these children? They didn't create this environment, yet they have to navigate it every single day of their lives. What is the American social compact? Does it even exist? Unlike Canada or other Western democracies, the U.S. doesn't have universal health care. It doesn't certainly have a universal child care benefit. It doesn't have highly subsidized post-secondary education. The U.S. doesn't have much by way of universal social benefit policies at all. This is the land of the so-called American dream. But what are the fundamental agreements that underlie that dream. As I looked around East Baltimore, I had a hard time imagining any social compact whatsoever. And I wondered, for the low-income residents of East Baltimore, whether they really ever had a meaningful shot at the American dream. I noticed something else in East Baltimore. As I wandered around and looked into the eyes of children, I started to notice something it was very disturbing. I noticed an absence of hope, an absence of light. These kids were barraged with a message every single day of their lives that they weren't valued, that they didn't matter. And they internalized that. And that caused frustration and anger and eventually despair and a loss of hope. 
And as that happened, you could see the lights literally turning off in their eyes. This is what happens to people when they feel they don't have control, when they don't have a sense of agency. I'm going to get back to that a little bit later. So here I was, this young medical student at this prestigious medical school, and I felt like I was learning so much about medicine. But outside the walls of the fortress Johns Hopkins, I had no idea what was happening in the streets. And this question started to incubate in my mind. In America, when it comes to your health, does your zip code matter more than your genetic code? 25 years later, that quote was attributed to me by Forbes magazine as the number one healthcare quote in 2013. Let me tell you how that came to be. It starts with death. After I graduated Hopkins, trained in internal medicine, I subsequently ended up being the health officer of Alameda County. The health officer's job, and it's a great job for data junkies like me, is to be the registrar of all deaths in Alameda County. There are about 10,000 deaths in Alameda County every year. And each of those deaths has a death certificate. And I have to sign each of those death certificates. So I used to say in Alameda County, you're not dead until I say you're dead. <laughs> and I knew, having been in East Baltimore, that there was a story to be told in these death certificates, hidden within these death certificates, that we could tell about how opportunity is laid out in a society. On a death certificate, you know what somebody died of. You know what age they were when they died. You know their race, ethnicity, and you know where they lived. And those four pieces of data in tens of thousands of certificates can tell you a lot about a community. So, we took Alameda County and every neighborhood in Alameda County, and we calculated, on average, how long people could expect to live in their neighborhood. And that map ended up on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. Those green areas are neighborhoods where people can reliably expect to live 80 years. The red areas, people can only expect to live about 74 years. And the yellow areas are in between, in between 74 and 80. Now, in the city of Oakland, we found neighborhoods that were close together, within a couple miles of each other, where the life expectancy difference was greater than 20 years. And it wasn't just in Alameda County. I had to go back to Baltimore. I had to see how that played out. In Baltimore, there are neighborhoods where, on average, people only live to 58 years old. We went to Minneapolis, St. Paul, to Seattle, to Philadelphia, to Boston, to New York, to Cleveland, to LA, everywhere we looked, we found life expectancy differences on the order of 15, 20, 25 years in the same city. So what's happening in these low life expectancy communities? Well, very simply put, these communities are functioning like incubators of chronic stress. Our fractured social compact has rendered these places without the basic social, political, and economic infrastructure that people need to be able to pursue the American dream. Bad schools, poor housing, inadequate health care, poor transportation, lack of jobs, high crime, neighborhoods that are policed like military zones, a lack of access to parks, grocery stores, and even in some cases, no access to fresh, safe drinking water. Any human being placed in such circumstances inevitably develops chronic stress. That's what it would happen to you, it would happen to me. Chronic stress makes it much more likely that you'll develop cardiovascular disease, diabetes, any forms, many forms of infl inflammation. That's how the outside world gets under the skin and changes our physiology. In this country, low-income people are physiologically different than high-income people, not because they were born that way, but because we made them that way with our policy. Or more often, it's the absence of policy in the face of abject need. And that policy creates a high degree of social vulnerability so that these communities, like in East Baltimore, are susceptible to any threat that comes along, whether it be a foreclosure crisis, HIV AIDS, a heroin epidemic, or even a hurricane. So our policy is literally making people sick 
and killing them prematurely. How does this work physiologically? Well, the body perceives a stressor through the brain. The hypothalamus sends a message to the pituitary gland, which sends a message to the adrenal glands, which release a cascade of hormones, amongst which cortisol is one. Low-income people in this country are awash in cortisol. And it's not just low-income people in their cities, low-income people that are living in America's rust belt, our working-class communities are increasingly facing the same kind of stressors. This kind of chronic stress actually changes physiology, it changes your behavior, and it changes how your genes are expressed. So chronic stress, which is driven by the policies that we've created, is as lethal as any knife or any gun. It's not just low-income people. The U.S. life expectancy now is 43rd in the world and slipping. So we know that 80% of what affects our health happens outside the healthcare system. Yet we still operate through the medical model. The medical model basically says that bad behavior produces disease, which produces premature death. So we use ambulances and emergency rooms to try to prevent death. We use 15-minute clinical encounters to try to change the course of disease. And we use brochures and pamphlets to try to change people's behavior. And this is necessary. But it's a $3 trillion enterprise. It's bankrupting us. And it's not improving our health. But there's so much more to this story. The low-income people in East Baltimore didn't create East Baltimore. Government policies and private policies created East Baltimore. Why? Because of a narrative of exclusion. A narrative says that those low-income populations are not entitled to a fair and robust social compact. And the consequence of this is dramatic. And it's not just low-income people. Increasing data suggests that white, educated and insured populations in this country are in much worse health than their peers internationally. This broken social compact hurts all of us. I'm not immune. You're not immune. The fate of this child is all of our fates. So there's no pill, MRI, or fancy surgery that's going to solve this problem. So rather than using the old prescriptions, it's time for a new prescription for health. Rather than asking people to beat the odds, it's time to change the odds. And that's what we're doing. We're working to create a whole new approach to health in California. We've put a billion dollars on the table. It's a billion dollar bet that we can prove that there's a better way. We're organizing people to come together to reweave California's social compact. And these people are taking control of their environment, and they feel agency. Let me tell you what this looks like. Fresno, California. If any of you had lunch today, you probably had fruits or vegetables that came from Fresno. It's the 20th Congressional District, one of the poorest congressional districts in the United States. It also feeds the world. In 2014, the Board of Supervisors in Fresno decided that they wanted to cut off health care to 5,600 low-income, undocumented Fresnans, many of whom are farm workers who are feeding us every day as they toil in the fields. But then something happened. People stood up, advocates, activists, and they said, no, this will not happen on our watch. They organized, they came to the Board of Supervisors and they said, you will not do this. And the Board of Supervisors backed down. In the Fresno school systems, young people organized because 15,000 kids are suspended and expelled in Fresno every year. Young people organized and they went to the district and they said, no, you won't do this. We don't want to be fed from the school to prison pipeline. And they forced the district to adopt restorative practices and suspensions plummeted 43%. And it's not just in the school system. In South Fresno, where there are one quarter the number of parks that you have in North Fresno, people got together, they organized, 
they held press conferences, they talked to the mayor, and they forced the city to update its parks master plan. And just this week, Governor Brown signed a bill that brings $70 million to Fresno to address that inequity. Let me tell you about Long Beach. In Long Beach, the port of LA Long Beach is one of the largest ports in the United States. It wanted to expand its rail yards to run 8,000 trucks through a neighborhood in Long Beach that already has high rates of asthma, high rates of cardiovascular disease, and high rates of emphysema. People organized, they said no, and they got the port to back down. In Coachella, in the United States, in 2016, there are places in this state where people can't get access to safe, potable drinking water. 150,000 Eastern Coachella Valley residents had no access to safe drinking water. They organized, changed the way that the, the water district did elections, and now they have a representative and an opportunity to get infrastructure for themselves in the Eastern Coachella Valley. I could tell you about Richmond, where violent crimes are plummeting because of work being done there. I could tell you about City Heights, where Muslim students now have access to healthy halal meals. The odds are changing in California. 50,000 people working together to create a new social compact, and it's yielding results. Hundreds of policies all over the state, 300,000 fewer suspensions and expulsions in California over the past three years. Five million people newly insured. A million people now eligible to reclassify their felonies into misdemeanors quarter of a million undocumented kids eligible for full scope health benefits. California is changing, we're changing the narrative, we're building a social compact for everyone. How long will you live? Go to our website, put in your address, and you'll find out. You may be surprised. Thank you. <laughs>